Senator Rice. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This isn't my first speech. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak on these bills today. I've been in the Senate for three days and I feel like Alice in Wonderland, where a different world, everything is just turned upside down. I've been listening to the coalition argue that white is black, that climate change isn't happening. I've been listening to the pup senators arguing that getting rid of the, the price on carbon will be good for low-income people. And all of them arguing that repealing the price on carbon will solve all the problems of the Australian economy and usher in a new era of prosperity and well-being. I think it's very appropriate that in my first week here in the Senate that climate has been the issue that we have been debating, however, because it was climate change that politicised me. I studied science at Melbourne University and I learned about climate change when I was 20 in 1980 and I distinctly remember coming out of a lecture thinking, this is really serious. The world needs to be doing something about this. It motivated me not to go on to a career as a research scientist but instead to become a campaigner, working to be protecting our world against the impacts of climate change. In 1980, the science of modelling the likely impacts of global warming was in its infancy, and it's de developed massively since then, but the overall message has stayed the same, that continuing to pump carbon dioxide into our atmosphere will have major, irreversible and extremely damaging impacts on our climate, our oceans and our whole way of life. The impressive thing about the science is how consistent it's been. And if you look at the projections made in the 1990s, they are remarkably consistent with the projections prepared by the IPCC last year. They've become more detailed, more specific, some minor changes, but the overall projected impacts are the same. Overall increasing global temperatures, increasing climate variability, increasing rainfall variability, increasing extreme weather events, increasing sea surface temperatures, sea level rise, increasing acidification of our oceans, melting of glaciers and the ice caps. The other sobering reflection I have from thinking back to learning about climate change in 1980 is that at that stage carbon dioxide was only at 340 parts per million. It's now 400. And that means that in the intervening years of my adult life, carbon emissions have our carbon levels have increased as much as they had in the previous thousand years. And carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere are now the highest they've been for the last million years. The full impact of what the consequences of our carbon pollution doesn't seem to have hit home for many people in this place. And I don't understand how they can't understand. For example, the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet is in the news this week. And babies born today, your child, grandchild, friend's child born today, will be alive when this occurs. Do we really want to bequeath this to them? Melting ice sheets are just one of the impacts of climate change, as those of us who understand the, the science know. And the reality of climate change is a story of big and evolving impacts on people today and massive impacts in the future. And one only needs to start looking at and thinking about the potential impacts that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is projecting for Australia. We can start with bushfires, the increased frequency of bushfires, increased severity of bushfires, increased spread across the country and across the year, beginning earlier and continuing later. And you think of the likely loss of life that that's going to occur, occur, the personal losses, the personal costs and the public costs of dealing with increased bushfires. Victoria's Black Saturday bushfires of February 2009 cost the community more than $4 billion, according to the subsequent Royal Commission. And this doesn't include the health and social costs and the flow-on costs to business. And the costs around the world of the extreme weather events that climate change is going to result in are massive. The global reinsurer Munich, Munich Ray recently predicted that the cost of all the extreme weather events in Australia is set to soar from $6.3 billion a year today to about $23 billion a year in 2050. And as the frequency of, and intensity of severe events like bushfires really rises together with our rising population. 
So I want to do, I feel it is our responsibility to do everything in, in my power to stop this awful scenario happening. happening. Other things, the increased frequency of heat waves. And those in this chamber who share my concern, the Greens' concern for people on limited income, people living in public housing, people living in poorly insulated public ha housing that are heat boxes in summer, will care about what happens to them in heat waves. 374 people died from the heat wave in Victoria in 2009, in the two weeks prior to Black Saturday, almost twice as many as the 174 people who died, on, died in the, those horrific fires. There are things that we can do to reduce this loss of life, better insulated housing, more energy efficient housing, better quality housing, and these are exactly the sorts of measures that, that can be funded through revenue from a price on carbon. I think of the impact on agriculture. I spoke this week to a young woman whose family has a vineyard in South Australia, and her father is despairing. He doesn't have any superannuation. His whole wealth is based on his vineyard, and he can see the value of his vineyard evaporating before his eyes every year when the quality of his grape crop crashes because of extreme summer heat, when it's affected by smoke taint from bushfires occurring where bushfires just haven't occurred before. She's advising him to sell up now before it's worth absolutely nothing. He's reluctant, but he is depressed and despairing. This is the cost of climate change. Think of what one metre sea level rise is going to mean to Australian cities. Think of your favourite beach. Think of it no longer there. Think of a two metre high seawall instead. Think of suburbs like Altona in Melbourne, where I grew up. It already has a one metre high seawall. Sea my mother's house, where she's lived all her life, is a kilometre a kilometre inland. It's less than half a metre above sea level. Yes, we can build that seawall another two metres higher, but at what cost? Financial cost, cultural cost, cost to our connection with the coast, with the sea, with nature, with our treasured Australian way of life. It's these impacts and more, many more, that are why the young people of the Australian Youth Climate Coalition were out there on the Parliament House lawns on Monday. It's these issues why there are so many people around the world who are passionate about the need for real, urgent action to be reducing our carbon pollution, not just reducing it by 5 per cent, but reducing it, getting rid of our carbon pollution so that we will have a future. What I want to achieve in the Senate in my time here is to be helping to shift us towards that 21st century future, to a 21st century economy that's based upon renewable energy, that all of the mainstream economic institutions in the world are now saying is not only possible, that it's econo it makes economic sense. We have the solutions. All that we need is the political will to be implementing those solutions, to be challenging the vested interests of the fossil fuel industries and to be shifting our economy to the, the bright future that is there with renewable energy industries and to a really caring, sustainable future for us all. Thank you.